Gabe, it's great to see you, and uh, uh, and thanks so much for uh, for joining me for this conversation. Good uh, to see you, Gabe. Yeah, you know, this past uh, year uh, has been you know dizzying with uh, how packed the news cycle has been about everything, of course. Uh, but uh, but among the things that has been uh, this has been a really busy year for has been the world of sports. Uh, and, uh, and of course, you know, thinking about COVID and of course, we're all watching, you know, week to week to see, uh, how we can successfully pull off, uh, both, uh, professional and college sports, uh, in this environment. And obviously with Cam Newton in the news, uh, this week and, uh, the Titans outbreak and, you know, but that's all sort of intensively short term at the immediate uh, how do we get through the week? I uh, wonder if you would just, if looking longer term, uh, farther down the road, do you see uh, the possibility of any lasting changes or impact from our experience with COVID on the world of either college or professional sports? Yeah, I do. And I think there's going to be a lot of potential changes and some maybe at the micro level, some at the, at the more macro level. And I would say on the, the more specific issues where we're already starting to see changes, and it's not just in sports, it's all around the world, is how you deal with the contractual issues that have popped up. And in, in the sports world in particular, you have, whether they're sponsorship deals or broadcast deals or player contracts, that typically contemplate a full season of play unless there is an injury or something else, but not a shortened season because of a pandemic. And if you are a sponsor who is paying X amount of dollars to have their ads shown on 80 baseball games, but it ends up only being shown on 30 baseball games, how much do you get back? And if your sign signage is up in the stadium, but you only have 10% of fans in there or 0% of fans in there. And so I think what we're seeing now is every lawyer in every party that is somehow involved is trying to figure out, all right, what, what do we do for the future? And how do we anticipate this? And hopefully we won't have to anticipate this again. Um, but what can we do in terms of the specific contractual relationships? And then in the bigger picture, I think there are a couple things I'll focus on because there's a, there's a lot. But one is, one thing I talk about a lot is, is what makes sports different than a lot of other industries and competitors and what makes the Falcons and the Saints different than let's say Sony and LG is although the Saints and Falcons compete and have fans who are buying one product versus another product, ultimately the Saints and the Falcons and all the NFL teams are interdependent. That you can't have a league unless all of the teams, and this time I mean literally are healthy. And, and the league is only as strong as its weakest link, uh, which is why if the, in baseball we saw with the Marlins who now are miraculously in the playoffs and it looks like they might not even be able to make it through the first week of the season. We've seen it with the Titans that the teams are dependent on other teams and the players staying healthy. And I think just it highlights a lot of the issues that professional sports leagues have gone through, whether it's putting together a salary cap or free agency draft, having to think about how do we level as best as we can the playing field to make sure that all of the teams certainly have a chance to play, but then have a chance to actually win. And that's what makes sports so popular is this, you don't know who's gonna win, but they all have to be playing. And if they're all not playing, then the league is in trouble. So every team really is dependent on the success of, of every other team. And then the last point I'd say is something that's highlighted both in the pro and college level is the importance of having an athlete voice. And at the college level, just the ba basic health and safety protocols um, that they're really just taking what they're given and at the pro level, they at least have some say in, in collective bargaining and, and the terms and conditions of employment and the protections they get. But I think what will come out of this is that athletes more than ever realize the power they have if they come together. Uh, and I think that may change the interaction between athletic directors, coaches, and athletes, and also professional sports team owners and athletes. And I suppose that that may be the, that sort of shifting balance between the power of players and uh, and the teams uh, might be also driven not just by the COVID experience, but also by uh, the experience with the uh, national reckoning for racial justice and uh, that that we're experiencing. Absolutely, 
I think there's no question that those are, it's kind of been the, the perfect storm. I know it's a bad term to use as a hurricane is headed our way, but the, it is this, this, this perfect combination of factors that have um, given athletes, one, a platform, because really nothing else live was happening on television other than sports. Um, and also this affects so many of them. If you look at the demographics of the NBA and the NFL, these are sports predominantly played by black men. And the, the statement of unity and the show of unity by the Milwaukee Bucks team uh, walking off the court before the playoff game. I mean, it, there are a lot of these things now where players have said, we can make a difference and we, we need to make a difference. So whether it is health and safety or racial justice and things on the court or off the court, again, I, I do think that's gonna be part of a, a growing trend. Yeah, thinking about the changing uh, the changes coming to the world of college athletics uh, as well, in particular, uh, and uh, uh, you've been obviously deeply involved, uh, really in a highly prominent way, uh, in the unfolding debate over compensation for college athletes now for for years, uh, and uh, for for anybody watching who may not uh, be following day to day, uh, you know you're. Your role in this goes back prominently to a, having authored a, a, a white paper for the Knight Commission on back in 2016 on the implications of college athletes' uh, uh, compensation for their use of name, image, and likeness. Uh, and, uh, and now you've more recently been appointed as a reporter for the Uniform Law Commissioner Commission looking into uh, these issues and testified before state legislatures and uh, obviously very prominent in the media on all of this. And so uh, wonder, lots of stuff is breaking. There's been talk about, you know, debate over this question about whether college athletes are being exploited for years and years, but now things seem to be busting wide open on it. And I wonder if you could, you know, why is that suddenly busting open now? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's, um, it, it's, it's, been great for me, I have to say, personally and professionally, because as you know, I've spent a lot of my career writing and teaching about the intersection of antitrust and labor law and intellectual property law and sports. And this is all of those issues coming together and I've now had the opportunity to present my views uh, at, a, at the more mainstream national level, and as you said, through the, the Knight Commission white paper and then presenting to the NCAA and now we're in the middle of drafting a uniform state law that will cover name, image, and likeness for college athletes. And we had about 80 people on the call, uh, seven hours worth of calls over the, the last couple of days to try to find some common ground. And uh, in the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of, of all the racial injustice issues, the US Senate held three hearings on college athlete name, image, and likeness uh, within the last month and a half. And though there's, there are a lot of eyes on it, and I think it can be traced back to two things. One is the, the recognition of the growing disparity between the money that is out there in particularly college football and men's and women's basketball and coaching salaries as they're skyrocketing and television deals. And although athletes, many athletes are on full scholarship and get tremendous resources, their compensation has been capped. So while revenues are skyrocketing, the level that the athletes are getting has pretty much stayed the same. And that's caused people to think, well, this, why is this happening? This, this system seems unfair. And uh, California passed a law uh, about a year ago that would give college athletes the right to make money off of their name, image, and likeness. It wouldn't require anyone to pay them. It wouldn't require the schools to pay them. In fact, the schools can't pay them, but it would prevent the schools from preventing third parties from paying the athletes. And that was the first real domino. And since California, there've been four other states that have passed laws. And I think it's now 32 others that have legislation pending right now. Um, and that led the NCAA to perk up maybe more than they have in the past and said, wait a minute, we can't have individual state laws dictate the the rules of our game. Our, our, our college sports enterprise is based on the notion that college athletes are not paid for their participation and not paid beyond their educational expenses. And this would require athletes in California to be allowed to be paid for that. They said, we need a uniform rule. We need to 
expedite this. So they put together some legislation that is pending right now, and they're going to announce it at the end of this month, vote on it in January. That would take place, take effect in August of 2021. But Florida's law would take place in July of 2021. Congress is looking at this. They have antitrust litigation. They just appealed an antitrust suit the NCAA did to the Supreme Court. So we're going to see if the Supreme Court takes that case all on the same issue, all on compensation for college athletes. What may end up happening is if Congress does not pass something soon to preempt the state laws, and it doesn't look like Congress is going to be doing anything anytime soon with everything else going on, then we, are, we have a showdown where Florida's law will take effect in July, and the NCAA says the NCAA will be destroyed if Florida's law takes effect. So we may have the NCAA suing Florida, claiming that their state law is unconstitutional because it interferes with their ability to engage in interstate commerce. And you know, it's not a great PR look, no matter what you think of the NCAA, for the NCAA to be suing a state to prevent that state from providing college athletes more economic rights. But that's where we may be headed. Wow. So this is, uh, it's wild to think about uh, the, this kind of interstate competition uh, in this area, because I presume, I mean, if, uh, if the world opens up for compensation for college athletes, uh, more widely, well, that gets back to the point you were making earlier about the shifting balance of power between athletes and the organizations for which they play, I presume. Uh, and then if some states are more aggressive in opening up, allowing for compensation than other states, I presume that that has to affect uh, athletes, uh, the, you know, at least the most talented athletes' uh, choices about where to uh, go to school, because it would have a huge implication, I'm guessing, for... Yeah. Uh, uh, financially. Uh, exactly. And so yeah. is that, do you think it will d push to have national uniformity in, in order, because otherwise, I guess, what you were saying before about professional teams needing parity to be competitive, uh, colleges need some parity, I suppose, to be competitive. They, yeah, no, they do. But it's interesting is that college sports, for the most part, they just, they don't have parity. You, you can look in the the, the same schools are in the college football playoff almost every year. The same schools are in the final four, the sweet 16 every year. Uh, and there's actually the competitive imbalance in college sports is part of, I think, what makes it so popular because the, the most popular event in college sports overall, for the most part is March Madness. And people love it because of the Cinderella story. And you can't have a Cinderella if everybody is the princess or the queen, I forget no. what the, but you, you <laughs> They, they without the unevenness, then there, there are no upsets. Um, but they still do want some semblance of competitive balance. They still do want the teams to be on a relatively even playing field, not quite to the extent that the pros do. But you're right. I think it highlights, one, the athlete empowerment issues, and two, that it all is interconnected, that, that these teams, whether at the pro level or the college level, rely on each other and there are lots of benefits to having uniform rules. And without uniform rules to an extent, you can't have a game. We can't have the Tulane-Houston game unless Tulane and Houston agree where to play and when to play and under what rules. Right? Sony and LG never have to reach those types of agreements. So there has to be some uniformity. The question is, how far out does that uniformity extend? And does it require uniform rules on name, image, and likeness? But to your recruiting question, it, that's not a hypothetical issue. When Governor DeSantis, Florida's governor, signed Florida's name, image, and likeness bill into law earlier this summer, he did it at the University of Miami new practice facility. The Miami athletic director introduced him. And when he was signing it, Governor DeSantis said, hey, athletes, Clemson and Alabama are great schools, but you all should be coming to Florida because Florida will give you things that uh, South Carolina and Alabama cannot because of this new law. And if the governor of the state is going to be using the law as a recruiting pitch during this press conference, you can only imagine what coaches are going to be doing behind closed doors. We can, again, it's part of the fear where the NCAA says, well, wait a minute, we can't have individual state laws. You all have to play by the same rules. University of Florida may always be better than FIU in football, but we at least have to give everyone a chance to compete on the same playing field. 
Yeah, well, incredibly important uh, things afoot, and I'm really proud of your leadership role in it. Uh, you know, turning to, uh, just to focus a bit more on Tulane for a moment, this has been a really big year uh, for you and for uh, your work on campus, uh, both uh, here at the law school, we're extremely proud that in the past year you've been named to the nation's first endowed professorship dedicated to sports law, the Cher Garner Professorship in Sports Law. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then also, uh, more recently, uh, Tulane uh, was the beneficiary of this amazingly uh, landmark gift from the Hertz family uh, uh, to the Center for Sport. Uh, so you're among your many hats as Associate Provost for NCAA Compliance uh, and as the Director of our Sports Law Program at the Law School and Co-Founder and Co-Director of the Center for Sport at the University. Uh, could you just say a word about the, first of all, the interrelationship of the Center for Sport and the Sports Law Program? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the Center for Sport came about because Greg Stewart, who's over in Tulane Medical School and team doctor for football, and is one of the nationally recognized voices in sports medicine. He was doing a lot in sports, and I was doing a lot in sports, but we were doing it next to each other. And we had a conversation one day and realized, we're both doing a lot of the same things, but we're not doing it together. We should start collaborating. And that was the germ of the idea for the Center for Sport, to put an umbrella over all of the different entities on campus that are studying and working on sports to make it a true interdisciplinary effort with a recognition that I think one, it could provide better research and, and services to the community and to professional and college sports, uh, but also a better educational experience for our students. That we could have classes that look at the legal, medical, business, public health, public policy issues that are raised by sports and what better way to learn about all these different issues and have experts from across campus come together and, and teach it and have law students learn from med students and learn from business school students to pick up on issues they wouldn't otherwise pick up in their law school class or in their, in their med school class. And I, for me, it was a perfect opportunity to help our students learn about sports in the event that they want to work in the sports industry, but frankly, for more students to learn through sports. Because just like most college athletes won't turn pro in their sport, most students won't get a job in sports, or many won't get a job in sports. So I want to prepare them to get a job in any industry. And this is a little bit of a spoon, spoonful of sugar. When I talk about the NFL draft and salary caps, students want to learn about it, want to learn more without realizing that they're learning about antitrust law and labor law. So it's a great teaching vehicle to, to teach subjects in a way that I think is, is particularly effective. So to have it happen at an interdisciplinary level um, has, has been great. And that's what the center has done is help bring the sports law program together with sports medicine. We're all still operating independently, but this is a way to help us collaborate more effectively. We're incredibly proud at the law school that the, the sports law program here at Tulane is the leading program uh, in the country and frankly the world, hands down. Uh, and, uh, and excited about what you're developing on campus through the Center for Sport. What is, uh, you know, this infusion of, you've done so much of this kind of on a shoestring and through your own, uh, you know, entrepreneurial spirit, but, but now there's this infusion of resources coming through the generous support of alumni, uh, both the Cher and Garner families uh, and the Hertz family. Uh, and what will that mean for uh, your work? Yeah, it, it's, it's going to mean a lot, and it is going to mean the opportunity to build on the programming we already have to enhance it and then to add a lot of new programming. Um, and, and, I, and as I tell people, I try to focus on three things for every component of the sports law program, and that's to educate our students, help them network, and help them gain experience to ultimately get a job. And this will just enhance all of those oppor opportunities. And we, we have our baseball arbitration competition, football negotiation competition, basketball negotiation competition. We have something new every year, but as you said, it, it, it's a, been a, a bit like running a marathon. When we're done each year, I'm exhausted and don't think I can ever do it again. I've never run a marathon, but I hear that's how people feel. Uh, but this will allow us to have more support to make sure we can do it every year and we can do it better every year. And then add on a lot of components, including boot camp skills training, to enhance a mentorship program that we launched two years ago that 
already with this new funding, we're, we've taken it from, we had 80 mentors in the sports industry for 40 plus or so of our students. And I think this year we're gonna have 160 mentors for our students. And we're gonna have better ways of tracking their involvement, engaging them and incorporating them throughout the program and, and figuring out ways to enhance the online education, in-person education. Um, I, I think the program has kind of gone, the sports club program from zero to 40 or 50. And this is gonna give us an opportunity to go to 100 or 120 or whatever counts as fast work hard ethos. Well, it's incredibly exciting and uh, so grateful for their support, but also grateful for your leadership uh, of uh, all of these programs. It's uh, uh, Yeah, and I wanna, let me take this opportunity also to thank Lee and Jim and Doug. They, they've been incredibly supportive throughout my career and, and this is just taking it to the next level and, and couldn't have done it without them and, and excited about the things I'll be able to do because of them. That's great. And maybe just a closing thought uh, about the future, the exciting future and the work that you're doing. Uh, do you see, you know, kind of looking over the horizon, uh, any exciting or important uh, uh, questions, issues in your field that are just sort of not just coming into view? Yeah, I, I think the, the one that's been out there, and it, again, the issues have been heightened because of the last six months, but player welfare issues, and you can put them in player health and safety issues, but I think it's broader than that because it's also social issues, not just um, physical issues. And that's where I think part of the beauty of working with Dr. Stewart and other folks on campus, where we can look at the athlete, look at the sport, not just from the legal perspective, but also the medical perspective, the, the psychological perspective, the social perspective. Um, but one of the aspects more specifically that's gonna have a legal impact, and we're seeing this not just in sports, is privacy issues, and in particular with wearable technology. And that's a hot button issue in lots of workplaces, but when an athlete is asked to wear a, something on their wrist or on their chest to help them uh, figure out when they should remove that pitcher from the game because it doesn't matter if you've thrown 30 pitches or 150 pitches that but your biometrics say you're okay or say you're not okay that it's designed to enhance athlete mm -hmm. performance but there's also a concern of what they're going to do with that information beyond wow. just trying to make them a better pitcher or improve performance and particularly that the technology that's used uh, 24 hours a day to measure your sleep and your activity that all that information, all the data, how we can balance the, the benefits of it versus all of the, the potential privacy issues and the misuse and abuse of it. And that ties in with whether it's Facebook or any other use of data. I, I think it's, it's become a massive issue at the pro and college level for sports. That's amazing. Uh, well, thanks so much, Gabe, and, and thanks to everybody for joining us uh, in this program. And we were so excited to look forward to the next homecoming uh, when we can get everybody back on campus for uh, for all of this. So, uh, thanks so much, Gabe, and, and thanks, thank Dave. you. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.